Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 372, the Recover from Surgery edition. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's the 21st of February. My my son calls it the Mad-Eyed Moody edition from Harry Potter, or Cyclops, if you're, Cyclops. If you're more classically orientated. <laughs> anyway, may, may the Lord grant us internal as well as external sight. Yes. Okay, so... My average me email or Facebook post starts off from a, a, a friend of ours or a viewer. How's Gavin? How's Gavin doing? Where's Gavin? I haven't seen Gavin. Where is my morning prayer Where or daily prayers? Gavin's no longer on, on the internet. A fear goes over people when you go missing for a couple of days. A bigger <clears throat> fear uh, comes over them when you come back with an eye patch. So let's back up a little bit. Uh, you have not joined the Pirate Brigade. You uh, actually had uh, retina surgery again because uh, your retina retore, uh, something very horrible, uh, and uh, you had to go back for surgery. What's the what's the update? Um, well, it, it's good news in the, in the sense that, um, first of all, the surgery I had in the, the autumn was incredibly painful, and I don't think they did it very well. Um, so the retina fell off again, and it may have been because they slipped a cataract operation in and shouldn't, or it might have been because um, my eyeball is a particularly challenging shape. Uh, but either way, uh, I began to go blind again, and so they've redone it with something called a scleral buckle, which is like tying a football lace around your eyeball, and um, hopefully the extra work they've done this time will mean it doesn't happen again um, and uh, certainly I'm in much less pain the incredible news uh, is that last time I had the recovery position was 45 degrees on one side day and night for about 10 days so when they told I said what's my recovery position and they said it's upright and I said yes I can do that <laughs> so uh, it means in the daytime I get to sit like this which is why we're able to talk now that's good uh, and and at night time I have to sit in, in a chair like this I use one of those airline collars to keep my head straight and um, sleeping upright is is not easy so I'm not as fresh as I might be well let's assure our critics you are not currently sleeping now no. <laughs> okay, just, we have people, you know, who watch the show. Start, but you know, Kevin, if I start snoring or if yes. I go particularly blank, it, it means it's happened. <laughs> you would just like be at the uh, the synod meeting, another bishop. Yeah, I know, I know. Okay. All right. So, <laughs> center surgery. There's been some news in England. Uh, specifically, there was a, uh, an announcement about a merger. Um, one of the things about Christianity that's disappointing to me is there are fractures in the church. Um, it's been happening since day five. And uh, uh, we see that through history. We see that in the Church of England. We see that in the Anglican Communion, uh, the Church of Rome, uh, Lutheran Church, Methodist. All churches have fractures. And from time to time, you get to witness uh, a reunification or a bringing back together. Uh, the ACNA is a perfect example of the good that can occur uh, when people say, hey, we got more in common than we have apart. And I see that a little bit now in England with a merger. I thought I'd get you to talk a little bit about it. Yes, it's very interesting. Um, and I think what I'm going to say will probably be uh, provocative for some people. Um, but on the other hand, we're trying to uh, we're, we're trying to exercise discernment. So we... we need the Holy Spirit to give us some wisdom. I think the the, the divide, divisions or the, the different groups we've been talking about are not in fact the product of, of fraction. They're, they're the product of vision. Mm -hmm. So there, we have the church society, we have reform, and we have the fellowship of word and spirit. And they all came into being because a number of, uh, a number of Christians wanted more solidarity with people who believed, thought, and prayed, and read the Bible like them. So that's absolutely fine. And in one sense, the achievement of bringing these three groups together is a, is a really significant one. And one has to give credit to uh, all the people involved, uh, and to, uh, to Dr. Lee Gatiss, who's uh, in charge of the Church Society, and will, I imagine, head up this new unified group of evangelicals. However, that's the good news, but I they uh, they say quite rightly that 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 
um, there should be joy for having brought evangelicals together. I think I, I do, however, take issue with, with Lee's um, wider interpretation, because as he celebrates this uh, merger, he says this will counter the fiction that conservative evangelicals are dividing and leaving. Well, uh, that isn't actually a fiction, it's just a different narrative. Um, uh, it's certainly true that evangelicals are dividing because they're they're dividing in terms of their understanding about the nature of the struggle that's coming. Uh, evangelicals are dividing about women priests, they're dividing about women bishops, they're dividing about homosexuality. Uh, and in fact, you know, in, in a way, it's almost a symptom of the success of the last 30 years. I'd like to go back to John Stott and Martin Lloyd-Jones in a moment. But one of the marvelous things that's happened since John Stott and Martin Lloyd-Jones had the kind of argument that Lee Gatiss and I represent two sides of in the 1960s and 70s, is that evangelicals flooded into the Church of England in a, in a great movement of, of born-againness and renewal. But the difficulty with being evangelical is that, um, as Martin Lloyd-Jones was saying, for evangelicals, the church is made up of people who are born again and fellowship together. You know, that's it. Mm -hmm. That's the church. That's the standard. And therefore, you... Yes. That's the standard. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what we look, we see in the book of Acts, and that's good enough for us. Um, but the, one of the reasons that evangelicals have fragmented over this broad ecclesial and ethical spectrum is because, in fact, it isn't quite enough just to read the Bible and believe and pray together. Um, there are issues which begin to divide people and, and issues of discernment. So one of the problems we face at the moment is that the evangelical constituency is divided about gender and divided about ethical practice. Now, these three groups are conservative groups. They're not divided. It's excellent. But the real question is, uh, are they going to be able to stay in the Church of England and win the battle for biblical faith and orthodox ethics? Or um, has the Church of England been taken over by people who are far more adept at gaining control of an institution and are not going to let it go? Well, one of the points John Stott made, um, and I'm going from memory here, uh, is that we can do it within the system. We can do yeah. it within the Church of England. And, uh, you know, I'm sure Lee will appreciate this. I'm comparing him to John Stott. Lee has the same opinion. We can do it within the system. And uh, I appreciate that. And I kind of want that to be the default. But what we discovered here in the Episcopal Church was um, there were many people who believed that you can do it within the system up until the last moment. And then the, the, well, depos and then yeah. the deposition started. Then the attack started. Then the spiritual warfare on every Orthodox uh, clergy person in the Episcopal Church started, and they couldn't wait to to find an or organization like the uh, the ACNA. Well, that's absolutely right. And one needs to give credit to the uh, heterodox who are in charge of the Church of England for also learning their lessons from history because they too have looked at what happened in America and they have said we are not going to provide the uh, the Orthodox with a, a, a Jefferson Shorey. Yeah. So what's a rent? It's not Jefferson. Well, I get it wrong each time. Jefferts, it's right. okay. <laughs> Jefferts Shorey, excuse me. But um, you know what, what Thomas Jefferson did to the Bible is just what Catherine <laughs> Shorey does to the Bible. But go on. <laughs> so they, they too have looked at America and um, uh, they're not willing to to give that kind of provocation. So what? And there, there's a caveat for John Stott. John Stott said, uh, "We can stay in the Church of England as long as the Church of England does not take up standards that go against Scripture." Now, the two things that have happened since he said that are, first of all, the ordination of women to the priesthood and to the episcopate, uh, and a, a, a reading of a straightforward reading of Scripture in the light of the whole of the rest of Christendom for one and a half thousand years is that isn't acceptable. And if you do it, you're then going to produce other heresies. And lo and behold, the other heresies are flowing free and fast already. And the other one, of course, is the one about sexual ethics. Now, I think if John Stott were in the room now and we said to John, John, did you imagine that, that one could stay a faithful Anglican in a church that has produced these two heresies? He would say, no, absolutely not. At this point, Martin Lloyd-Jones wins. Uh, and I think that's the difference. The, the, I think so, so there's a theological issue where John Stott was right then 
and would I believe he would change his mind. But there's a political issue, and that is that we're facing uh, a, a culture of management in the Church of England. And at one level, it's easy to say, well, you know, this is not terribly impressive. The gospel's about more than management. Yes, you have to run an organization well, but you can't make management your goal. It needs to be a means to an end. Uh, but the problem, but at the same time, the, the, this, this group of managers are really rather good at what they do. Um, I, I listened to the Archbishop Justin Welby do a long interview with the editor of the Church Times on the website. Oh, that was fun. And, oh. and as, I, as I listened to it, uh, I, I listened to a very sophisticated, what I thought was a very sophisticated strategic voice. Uh, a voice that I, I'm afraid I didn't trust and I didn't believe in, and a voice whose um, whose uh, maneuverings I chanted, charted as he was asked the difficult questions. And essentially, uh, Justin Welby has taken the view that the church needs to accommodate itself to a secularized sexual ethic. This is so important um, that, that it needs to be brought out into the open. But He's determined to hide that from people for as long as he can, because he knows that if he doesn't hide it from people, he will produce the kind of situation that in America led to the birth of ACNA. So my my difference with 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 Lee Gatiss is, first of all, I I don't think that people are, are going to be able to live congregationally under the Episcopal or diocesan radar. I think the managers are too canny for that. And many of my friends talk about the way in which diocesan authorities, diocesan management, diocesan policy has all kind of exponentially stepped up like human resources in the secular world. Uh, and I, I think it underestimates the determination of the heterodox to run the church in the way they want to. So the only, you know, it's great that this merge has taken place, but um, I, I think it underestimates the next the seriousness of the next step, which I think can't be conducted within the institution for the reasons that John Stott gave. You're kind of a idealist versus a realist. Huh. Yes, I think that isn't that good. That, that's quite right. Interestingly enough, I was listening to Jordan Peterson talk about uh, exactly that dichotomy. And I mean, whereas you and I would look for for spiritual discernment, um, Jordan Peason was was doing it in psychological terms, and and he said essentially that people fall into two groups: that those who are uh, immensely accommodating, and and therefore see reciprocal accommodation all around them, uh, and these are optimistic, nice, kind people, and then there's the kind of the other lot, which I'm afraid is the category I fall into, <laughs> less accommodating, and therefore, therefore less likely to see accommodation where it doesn't exist. And of course, the the real question is, d does good natured uh, accommodation live with integrity in the Church of England? All this stuff about mutual flourishing, or whenever the issue is tested, does it fail? And so far, the fact is, mutual flourishing has failed. They don't intend to accommodate us. And I don't think if we remain faithful to the gospel, we'll be able to accommodate them. You and I both know Lee uh, is a work of church I've been many times. I, I am very comfortable with him in charge of this new merger. Um, idealist or realist or not, because uh, in the end, uh, I think uh, he would uh, be willing to uh, uh, certainly concede uh, some points uh, where there are big failures in the Church of England. We'll have to well, see what uh, happens. Uh, yeah, I mean, well, a foot a footnote to that yeah. is, yeah. and we might find ourselves taking this up at another time. I think a footnote to that would be to ask to, to look at Rod Thomas's ministry, yeah. and and to ask two sets of questions. Um, Rod is a man who deserves our respect, our affection, and our prayers. Uh, and at one level, he has achieved a great deal. He's moving from uh, being parked in a cul-de-sac in, in, in Maidstone to moving to, to London, where there are more people who want his ministry. But it remains the fact that anyone who accepts a position, a post within the Church of England, does so under conditions. Uh, and, and, and the very first issue with Rod was what kind of consecration would he have? Many people wrote to him saying, please don't be consecrated by those who've consecrated women because they put themselves outside the bounds of orthodoxy. Um, I th I, my, we, Rod could answer this question himself if we were to ask him. My guess is that at a personal level, I'm sure he would have agreed with that. However, at a professional level, he had no choice. 
he had to be consecrated by the people who'd consecrated women because it was one of the conditions of his appointment. Now, I'm afraid I think there will be other conditions of his appointment. They won't be made public. <laughs> you think? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and, and therefore, you know, this goes to the heart of uh, how accommodating a heterodox uh, ecclesiology is going to be to those who believe fundamentally different things about human faith and practice. One of the many cool things about uh, uh, the English, the Brits, is in conversation, uh, you get to learn things. Uh, they're, they're very wise people, but they can really insult you without you knowing it because of their <laughs> mastery of the language. Uh, a Westerner, American like myself, I could be in a conversation have just way over my head. you just been insulted, well, that's, that's insulted, good... insulted, insulted, you know. Um, we, we, have, we have this highly sophisticated understatement. We must get in touch sometime means I'm never going to see you again. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, give me a call means don't you know you won't hear from me. <laughs> um, so it's, it's very much a different language. You're quite right. It wants to pick it up. In this mastery, I was watching a person uh, bring up to Justin Welby the issue of whether or not a clergy or laity from the Church of England would be allowed to attend GAFCON. Oh, yes. <laughs> In his response, my Western ears heard, of course, no big deal. Go, enjoy. Uh, it's not a big deal. I look back at this. There's no way he said what I thought he said because he's English. No, no, he said one of, he so, said one of the rudest things imaginable. He I, came out with... <laughs> With a five-star insult, dressed up in Christmas packaging with bows all over it, <laughs> and so what? What he said was something like, um, the, the, "The syntax is wrong. The, the vocabulary is right. Uh, Gathcon's fine by me for as long as it exists as a ginger group." <laughs> now, Kevin, this reminded me of when I explained to my mother I was going to leave the law after all the years hard work they put in bringing me up, and she had a rather impoverished background and was keen that I should be financially secure and that I was going to be ordained in the Church of England. She said, dear, she said, dear, why, I don't mind you being a Christian, she said, but why can't you leave it as a hobby? A hobby? <laughs> this, was exactly, this was exactly the the kind of frame of reference that Justin Welby was using about Gafcon. You know, as a hobby, as a ginger group, mm -hmm. as, as one of these you know, casual amateur get-togethers who think odd thoughts and do nothing about them. I don't mind Gafcon at all. It's fine. <laughs> but of course, he, um, that is, you know, that isn't, Gafcon is not, should not, and will not be a ginger group. And therefore, I think the Archbishop's real feelings about it did not emerge in the course of that conversation. I think my mom and your mom have gotten together because my mom always <laughs> thinks one day I'll finally outgrow this Christian thing, you know. This little hobby. We'll see. <clears throat> All right, we need to move on to some sad news. Well, actually, glorious news. Uh, the dear evangelist Billy Graham has uh, uh, moved on from uh, this temporal place to a, a much more permanent place. Uh, it was announced uh, today that he died. Um, 99 years. Wow. Yeah, that's just something amazing. I have friends on Facebook. Um, my age or older who have come to faith through his ministry uh especially on the shores of england he visited there a couple of times he did um i think uh, i i i look to billy graham mm -hmm. as a man who would not compromise in the face of secular pressure for what the gospel really was mm -hmm. he preached about heaven and hell he preached about the need to repent and the need to be born again. And he would not dilute any of those categories one jot. And that's the problem with the Church of England at the moment. It appears to have no real interest in saving people from hell and carrying to heaven by means of repentance. It uses a lot of spiritual and gospel language, but this core dynamic that Billy Graham represented and served the Lord with so faithfully and so powerfully is, is what's missing. And like you, um, I have a number of friends who came to faith. I'm slightly, I'm not quite old enough to have attended the Haringey rallies, but I had mm -hmm. a, old friends I trained with who did. And one of the most moving uh, features of The Crown, if people have watched that on their TV or Netflix, is when the, the Queen meets Billy Graham and is quite clearly deeply impacted 
by the kind of Christianity that he represented to her. So I think, you know, Billy, Billy Graham is a model to us, first of all, of someone who never got trapped by, by the very serious temptations that were thrown in his way, and somebody who really would not compromise the essentials of the gospel, and God blessed him for it. There's a rumor, I don't know if it's true or not, but uh, in an interview or talking to a friend, he said, if I were to do it again, I would do it as an Anglican. As an Anglican, I'm not so sure that would have been the best choice, but... <laughs> I, well, I, think in those, I think in those days it would have been. I think what yeah. he's really doing was he was taking the John Stott side of the Martin yeah. Lloyd-Jones event mm -hmm. because... And, and actually, that reminds me of something I really badly want to say, and I'm so glad uh, that this has been brought back to my mind again. Because um, I'm not sure... I had no idea whether he would identify with what I'm about to say. But I've been very impressed with the way in which uh, Archbishop Foley Beach, as he's come to England to offer advice and counsel and encouragement from time to time, uh, ha has looked uh, his colleagues over here uh, firmly and courageously in the eye, and he has a good stare to Foley Beach and said, listen, uh, the way we have done this in America is we have understood Anglicanism to be uh, to involve sacramental Anglicanism, charismatic Anglicanism, and evangelical Anglicanism. In other words, you bring the Catholics and the charismatics with you. Now, if I have a criticism, and, and it, it, I don't mean this, uh, if, I have a, if I have a friendly critique of uh, the good news about church society and reform and the society of the Word and Spirit coming together, it is, that's great, but where are the Catholics and charismatics? Because if Foley Beach is right, and I'm sure he is, uh, then what you know the joy of being an Anglican is that that you actually get to be resourced by what the Holy Spirit has put into the whole church in a way that goes wider than just uh, fellowship and re and rebirth. And the fact is that as we look over the holiness traditions, above all holiness, both within sacramentalism and with Pentecostalism, um, we can see that actually I mean I, I don't mean to offend anyone, but you know being a conservative evangelical is a great place to start. It's a great place to always maintain, but actually it doesn't. It, it, it leaves you short of resources that other parts of the church, in terms of holiness and grace, are providing, and that's why I, I would I would very much like if um, uh, I'd love to see Lee Gatiss and uh, an Archbishop Foley Beach talking together, and seeing if Foley Beach could uh, persuade uh, Lee in ways that I've not been able to yet of the virtue of being truly Anglican and truly Orthodox, which would involve a, a, a richer remit for renewed Anglicanism. Well, in the last 22 minutes, we've compared Lee Gatiss to Stott, Stott to Graham, Graham to Foley. So I, I don't think we, we've done too bad here. Um, quickly, we need to uh, have some donations. If you've already donated to our trip to GAFCON, don't donate again. I, we, we need to get some fresh money. We need to get people who watch the show and say somebody else is going to donate. Yes, it's now, now we're calling on you. You're the somebody else. Today, the somebody else's need to, to donate. We're halfway there. Uh, I think I uh, really need about uh, maybe five to, to 6,000. We're at uh, 1,400. Oh boy, we can do it. Uh, I actually have a free ticket from Delta that I'm going to use, so that reduces the cost a lot. We're going to do an Airbnb uh, where the three of us stay in one uh, apartment on the, on the side of uh, Jerusalem there. That'll help a lot. Um, so we're trying to save as much money as possible, but if you could uh, please go to Anglican Inc. forward slash donate, either click the PayPal button, send a check, whatever you, you need to do, uh, that would help, help a lot. Now, uh, there may be some checks in the mailbox. I haven't checked since last Friday, so um, but still give anyway. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenden. You've been listening to episode 372 of Anglican Unscripted. Mm -hmm.